Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Olajmoke. So I wanted to start this video off by saying that what we are seeing still out of Europe remains just heart-wrenching. Um, the humanitarian devastation is just, it's crushing to see. And as I said in a previous video, I do hope that we come to a very quick resolution so that these communities can really start working towards rebuilding their lives. With that being said, I have received quite a few questions around how best to invest presently, you know, where you should be asset allocating, perhaps where you should consider in terms of sectors, in terms of asset classes, etc. So as I said, as devastating as it is to see what's going on in the world, um, beyond Europe, there are other war-torn areas of the world. But of course, life doesn't stop. The rich are getting richer, markets continue to operate, people are still investing, Firms are still, you know, capitalizing on the situation, as sad as it might be, but that is just the reality of our world. So in this video, I will shed some light on what's been going on with regards to the global economy, who have been the winners and losers out of the situation in Europe. And if you are already an investor or perhaps thinking about investing, how best to position your portfolios going forward to at least insulate against some of the tail risks that we are experiencing now and we foresee continuing into the future. Unfortunately, at the start of this year, we were in a very different scenario both in Europe and globally. We were at the point where I think people were coming to terms with the fact that the pandemic was coming to you know, some sort of an end, or at least we had gotten a grasp of how to defend ourselves in terms of healthcare, in terms of vaccines, etc., against the pandemic. And I would say that not too many people actually saw this war happening. You know, people called bluffs and you know no one really expected us to be in the situation we are in today hence the markets reacting so sharply we've seen a lot of gyration in stock markets we've seen moves of up to 50 percent 70 percent in some sectors and some stocks and that is the market pricing in what's happening in europe additionally we are in what is called stagflation that is high inflation. Inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years in the US, and we're also experiencing low growth. So a stagflationary environment is one in which you have high inflation and low growth. In one of my previous videos on my investor channel, I did mention, of course, that there is an expectation of higher inflation going forward. I believe the video was done last year or the year before because you cannot expect to have such a massive increase in the money supply in the economy via stimulus checks, bounce back loans, etc., and not expect that to have some sort of effect on inflation, core inflation going forward. That is just the natural progression of things. So I think that a lot of analysts, a lot of stakeholders in the markets, in the investment world, did expect inflation to ramp up at some point. But I think the speed at which it has done and also the magnitude with which inflation has risen, I think that was kind of the shock, really. No one expected inflation to be so high so soon. For some time, about six to nine months, the Federal Reserve in the US did class inflation as being transitory, i.e. it's not something that would be long lasting. Well, we, we're still in the short term and you know we still have the medium term, the long term to come, so they might be right. But I really don't think that inflation is transitory. I think this high inflation environment is here to stay. And so what does that mean for you as an investor? So when you have high inflation in an economy, it means that prices, general prices of goods and services are going higher. Also, when producers of goods are hit with high inflations, perhaps due to higher costs of inputs, that translates into higher inflation for you and I as consumers. So you see a lot of that when you go to the shops, perhaps for your groceries, when you're buying petrol or diesel, etc. So you see the actual change in pricing. Additionally, if your income isn't pegged to inflation, what I mean by that is that if you don't receive an annually adjusted rise in your income based on the inflation rate in your country, you know, 5%, 10%, 2%, etc., then that means that your wage, your real wage, is actually declining as inflation increases. It means that the value of goods that you could have bought with, let's say, £100,000 last year isn't the same value of goods or isn't the same amount of goods that you can get this year when you have higher inflation. And that's because you are expending more pounds or dollars per item than you did in the past. I hope that makes sense. 
So this video was sponsored by Coco and Crumble, an amazing brand for all things home fragrance. Visit www.cocoandcrumble.com for all your home fragrance needs. Whatever your preference, fruity, floral, zesty, oriental, earthy, aromatic, you're guaranteed to find a gorgeous fragrance for your home. Now, high inflation was already rampant and present before we had the occurrences in Europe. But of course, certain sectors have really taken a beating based on what's going on in Europe. Sectors such as oil and gas, of course, the price of oil has risen dramatically because of the supply shock coming out of Russia, i.e. the sanctions against Russia, making Russian oil no longer tradable. So a lot of nations have chosen to not buy Russian oil. So we are all feeling the effects of higher energy prices when you go to get your petrol or your diesel energy prices as well the price of heating up your home has increased and we keep getting warnings that there is more of an increase coming that's as a result of you know inflation a supply shock as i've said and so we actually are feeling the effects of these events in our day-to-day -day living Additionally, the agricultural sector has been hit as well. Ukraine actually accounts for 12% of the global supply of wheat, and it accounts for 16% of the global supply of corn. It also accounts for a significant amount of the global supply of other agricultural produce, such as soy. And so you can see that the shock in terms of the country not being able to produce these agricultural products, the shock of that has been reflected in pricing. And as we've seen, the price of of wheat and other agricultural inputs have really shot up over the past few weeks as well as the price of natural gas, uh, nickel, metals really. Wheat suppliers and other agricultural produce companies could be very interesting to look at at the moment because a lot of that supply shock will have to be replenished and these companies will most likely do well going forward. So there's a lot to think about but I personally am a bit weary about banks I don't believe that we've seen the full effects, secondary effects as well, of what's going on in Europe. I think that a lot of banks are saying, oh, you know, we're not really that exposed to Russia. It's just 1%, it's just 5%. But I think that what they're forgetting is that there are other secondary effects. So the bank itself may not be invested directly in Russia. So maybe some of its client portfolios and client businesses that the bank has loaned against or loaned to are exposed to Russia and Ukraine and undoubtedly would have experienced a negative shock to their businesses. In wartime, it not only shows the importance of having a very strong military presence and power, but also having enough arsenal in your military defense system. So given that the world is in the situation that it's in at the moment, the expectation from investors and stakeholders is that a lot more nations will start thinking about defense and increasing their budgets. So how should you be positioned as an investor going forward? Well, I actually think that for those who are not investors at the moment, this is a fantastic time to really think about getting into the markets, maybe starting with a very small amount that you know, you're comfortable with or starting with a significant amount of money just to put that to work for you over time. Although I've said that there's some sectors that have benefited very well from the ongoing events even before now in terms of the pandemic there are other sectors that still offer really good growth and income opportunities because they remain underpriced on the other hand if you are currently invested i know that it must be very heart-wrenching to see your portfolio value drop by significant amounts overnight that happens it's not something that you can necessarily control unless you are in a hundred percent cash and if you are a long-term investor you want to think about this from a long-term perspective. What I mean by that is that if you have very good quality sectors in your portfolio at the moment, sectors such as technology, banks, healthcare, etc., these sectors are still going to do well in the long term. There's also green energy sectors that you might want to think about. I think what this war has really brought to the forefront is that the world is looking to make a shift from you know your standard oil and gas you know energy sources into greener cleaner um, energy sources so green energy is going to be quite huge in the future we've already seen that from the evolution of electric cars and that will really permeate into other sectors within the economy where we go greener so if you are already a long-term investor this might be a time to cost average. What I mean by that is 
if you've bought a stock in the past and it was at hundred dollars or hundred pounds for example and the stock is down to 75 pounds or dollars at the moment you want to be buying some of those really high quality names now so that on average your cost is lower because i believe that the pullback in markets at the moment presents a very good buying opportunity there are certain sectors that tend to do well when you have stagflation sectors such as utilities healthcare, consumer staples, and also cryptocurrencies. These currencies are meant to act as a hedge against inflation. So the investment hypothesis behind cryptocurrencies is that they act as a hedge against inflation. We haven't quite seen that recently because they have also been gyrating quite a bit and they've actually come down from you know the high levels that we saw over the past two years. And so it definitely seems like there is some sort of a mismatch between what they're meant to do and what they are doing. But I think that in terms of cryptocurrency movements that we've experienced over the last few months, that can be attributed to investor behavior and biases as well. And that is why the cryptocurrency space is still very much a mystery to a lot of investors, but will remain a very, very interesting asset class going forward. So in summary, we have talked about how you might want to be positioned if you are an equity investor, i.e. you buy stocks. If you are a bond investor, things become a little bit more interesting because there is a relationship between inflation, which feeds into interest rates, which feeds into bond prices. So as we've seen over the past few months, bond prices have been declining and that's because the expectation for interest rates has been increasing and we've also seen the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England and some other central banks increase interest rates. This is because they are trying to curb or reduce inflation. So when you increase interest rates, the money supply within the economy tends to shrink because more people tend to save than spend. And some analysts across banks do expect up to seven rate hikes in the US alone this year, which means that your interest rates are going to be going higher. Now, what that means for bond pricing is there's a relationship between interest rates and bond pricing. When interest rates rise, the yields that you get on bonds tend to rise as well. However, that means that bond prices fall. So if you are a bond investor, you may have seen a lot of volatility in your portfolio over the last few months. Additionally, we are now hearing of a potential recession in the US next year. I mean, it's just like the markets, the world, we can't get a break. It's one thing after the other. But even within the bond space, there are different kinds of bonds. So you have your investment grade bonds, which are your safer haven sort of assets. And you have your sub investment grade bonds, which are your riskier bonds. Sub investment grade bonds tend to be your lower rated companies. Perhaps they have a riskier model. Perhaps they are in an emerging economy, etc. So they tend to yield higher because they are riskier. And your investment grade bonds are your US government bonds, your UK government gilts, your bunds, etc. And companies that are very well regarded or highly rated by rating agencies. So your triple A rated to your triple B rated companies, those are investment grade bonds, and bonds that are rated double B and below are junk bonds or sub-investment grade bonds. So as a bond investor, I think the question you need to ask yourself is what do you care about? Do you care about capital preservation versus income, or do you care more about the cash flow that you're getting from your bond portfolio versus any capital protection? So if you are more interested in cash flow and income coming from your portfolio now, as well as you know over the next sort of 18 to maybe 24 months would present very good buying opportunities where you're getting bonds at uh, discounts and you are clipping higher income or higher coupon levels. But if you are worried about capital protection and you really want to protect the value of your initial investment, then I would say that you need to be very selective as to what bonds you buy. So maybe buy investment grade bonds, which tend to hold their value when interest rates rise versus sub-investment grade bonds that tend to act like equities in distressed periods. So that is it for this video. I do hope it has been helpful. If you aren't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button. Also click the notification bell so you don't miss any of my new videos. Until next time, look after yourselves. Bye for now.